video, we address issues regarding self-defense techniques, dealing with unarmed attackers. The Krav Maga system defines self-defense techniques and differentiates between self-defense and fighting this way. In self-defense techniques, the attacker has committed himself to a particular hold or catch. It could be by grabbing the hair. It could be by choking someone, whether the choke comes from the front, the side, or the rear. It could be by a headlock, a variety of headlocks from different angles bear hugs, whether the arms are free or whether the arms are caught inside the hole. It could be someone lifting you and trying to take you from point A to point B. These various attacks, including self-defense techniques that occur when you're down on the ground, comprise the Krav Maga self-defense system. How did this system develop is the important thing. In Israel, the idea was that the Israelis wanted to be able to develop an army that was a powerful fighting unit. They wanted to be able to do this in a relatively short period of time to give people broad knowledge, to make warriors, to make people that could defend themselves against any possible threat. But the time was limited. They knew that they had to deploy their personnel for tactical reasons. And so they turned to a system of self-defense that could be taught quickly, that could be learned quickly, and that could be retained with minimal pra practice and review. The Krav Maga system was born in the army based on their needs. And how do we find the responses? How do we build people quickly to deal with problems? Is we look to see what their instinctive response to danger is. And perhaps the best way of addressing our approach to self-defense is to take an isolated series of exercises to point up our approach and how we deal with problems within each exercise. I'm going to use Michael for this purpose. If we look to see what we can do to build a technique, and I'll use the choke for example from the front. If I apply the choke to Michael, very strong, taking my thumbs and pushing him into the front part of his throat, and I have a very firm grip on his throat, and he has no training whatsoever and does not expect to be attacked this way, Michael will have an instinctive response to this danger, especially if he didn't expect the attack, if he's an untrained person. And his instinctive reaction will be similar to going to the threat or going to the danger. This is in everybody. It's their instinctive nature is to go to where they feel pain or pressure. His response may look like something like this to this position. And to build people quickly, we recognize we want the defensive approach, the defensive technique to be patterned after what is in us instinctively. And so what we try to do is build the self-defense technique based on this instinctive reaction, so to speak. Why do we do that? Well, because we end up building what we consider to be a natural response. If it's already in you, it takes less repetition to learn it. Also, if it's already in you, it takes less follow-up training so that it stays with you. And certainly the most important characteristic for us is that under the stress of a real life attack, when someone is trying to break you or hurt you or even kill you, that which is instinctive inside you flies from you. If you learn something that is far away from your instinctive response, 
most likely you will shut down or freeze in a time of need. So taking this particular example of the choke, what do we do with the instinctive response of going to the hands? We build the self-defense technique after that first movement. So now that I make this attack on Michael, how do we take that pattern of movement and put it into an exercise or a technique? This way. From this position, I'm catching the same way. From here, Michael makes a movement that has the same initial components as the instinctive response. But we call this a plucking defensive principle, where we are raking or plucking the hands away from the throat. Why? First of all, we look to see in every situation what is the danger. In this particular circumstance, the danger on Michael's throat were my hands pressing into the throat. We knew that there was an instinctive response to this danger, and we knew, by the way, that we had to deal with the danger first because permanent damage or injury can be inflicted in mere seconds. So that our approach first is to eliminate the danger using the, th the technique that's closest to our instinct. Michael did that with his plucking response. But that's not good enough for us because we understand that there can be variations in the attack. For instance, you saw me grab Michael with my arms in a relatively straight position. We build this defensive principle, plucking, based on the idea that it cannot be defeated. The defense itself cannot be defeated by variations in the attack. So you saw me attack Michael with straight arms. We understand that people sometimes will attack us with bent arms. And it would not make sense for us to have one technique for straight arms and one technique for bent arms. Because by the time you figure out as a defender, hey, are the arms straight, are the arms bent, you're thinking too much and you're not reacting. So we pick the principle, this plucking principle, that applies to the most scenarios, the most variations. And we test it. Will this plucking principle work when the arms are bent? From this position, I'm attacking. <coughs> and from here, we see that this plucking principle works for when there's a variation in the given attack. But that's not enough for us. We want to see, wait a minute. The attack doesn't always come from the front. Maybe a more clever attacker comes from behind. And now when I'm attacking Michael from this position, the danger is not, is not the thumb, or the thumbs on his throat, but my fingers pressing the front of his throat. And from this position, his instinctive response will be to grab, but the plucking defense comes from that instinctive response. So the exercise works, this plucking principle works from behind. But that isn't good enough. We want to make sure that we have a defense 360 degrees around us, from any angle, from any position. Does this plucking principle work if the attack comes from the side? From this position, I'm grabbing Michael now from this side position, and from here, he's making the same type of plucking principle defense based on what his instinctive response would be. So the defensive maneuver, we take a look and we see what is our instinctive response to the given hold or catch? How do we eliminate it in the shortest, fastest way using a natural reaction, a defense built from a natural reaction? The next issue we want to address in examining the approach to self-defense in the Krav Maga system is the issue of not just dealing with the most immediate danger in a given attack, but dealing with all potential danger. For instance, using the same example of choke from the front. If Michael were to defend himself by just making this plucking motion from here, maybe now he has a different fight on his hands. So the idea is, is wait a minute. Is it possible for us, as early in time as we can, to deliver a injury-causing or a uh, powerful counterattack? that will at least stop any future or potential danger that lies next in the order of sequence. So that we know something about the person who is attacking us with a choke. We know that that person, the attacker, must also have balance. We know that that person will be standing with his legs at least as wide as his shoulders, or their shoulders, I, sh I should say. 
So from this position, we know that no one comes to attack you with a choke standing in front of you like this from here, hiding themselves in the groin area or their feet close together because this would be a very weak position. They must have a base, a foundation from which to function. So knowing that, we decide early on, well, wait a minute, if we're going to make a defensive movement from here, a plucking action, we are going to make a simultaneous counterattack. This counterattack will deal with or shock the person that's attacking us enough to stop any future attacks, to stun him so that we can continue with additional counterattacks so that all future or potential danger down the road is dealt with immediately. So we combine the self-defense movement with an immediate counterattack. So the technique grows. From the front, what are we doing? From this position, from here, <coughs> Michael giving from this position an immediate counterattack. Look from this angle. Because my legs are wide, as Michael defends, he's sending his leg straight up, which catches the underneath of my groin, causing me at least an, in, an initial stun at the very least. And Michael then can follow up with appropriate counterattacks, take me down, control, or just simply leave the scene. The issue here is eliminating not just the first danger that was around your throat, but the person dealing with the attacker, not the hold that the attacker is making, but dealing with the attacker to enable that person to continue to cause you danger or damage. It is extremely important that our training is realistic. It must be safe on one hand and as realistic on the other hand as possible. It is also true that we must know how to operate from varying states of readiness. For instance, if I'm at a distance from Michael and I want to attack him with a choke and he sees me and he's aware of me and I come at him to choke him, from this position he should not let me get to him to choke him, despite the fact that he knows a good choke defense. In other words, if you see the attack coming and you are able to be ready for it, just because you know a good choke defense, you don't let someone choke you. We are trained in combatives. We're trained in blocking techniques. If you see a choke that's coming your direction, you move out of the way. You redirect the hands. You attack with punches and kicks. You don't stay and wait to be choked. However, we recognize two things. Sometimes our attention is diverted and people can capitalize on that and reach us and choke us and we must know how to defend against that. So we're not quite as ready, we're surprised. Or it could be, possibly, that we saw the attack coming but we froze in that moment. We're unable to stop it on its way and now have to deal with the problem in its place, the choke itself. So if I reach Michael and I choke him, maybe he was looking off in a different direction and I choke him, <coughs> now he must know how to defend himself. The concept that's of crucial importance is the concept of defending yourself from a position of disadvantage, meaning that we allow ourselves to defend from being in a weak position against a strong attack. An example could be that Michael is not ready to defend himself and the choke comes in such a way that the choke is delivered not just in its place but with a strong push backwards which we will address in this tape. As I push Michael from here he falls backwards. The defense must be made as we fail as we are falling back, as we are in a vulnerable position. Because what does it mean that someone got to you and reached you and are choking you? You may not even realize you're in danger until you're already falling back. If we could defend from that bad position, from that position of disadvantage, then we can defend from a more ready state. We must practice training from a position of disadvantage. And by understanding these varying degrees of readiness, we can understand how to bring realism, how to bring true-to-life danger and real-life attacks into the training drills.
The defensive exercise that we're going to present now deals with an attacker that is going to choke the defender. The choke is delivered in such a way that the defender remains in their place. However, the power of the choke is such that my thumbs, as the attacker, can crush the front of the trachea here. The defense must be swift, it must be effective, and it must be based on instinct so that there is no injury to the front of the throat. The attack looks like this, where my thumbs, again, as I mentioned before, can apply extreme oppress pressure in a very short period of time. <coughs> John has entered the scene to apply this frontal choke to Marnie. As he's applying the choke, you can see that there's pressure being applied to the front of Marnie's throat. This pressure is the pressure that can crush the front of her trachea. Marnie is making a plucking, instinctive response to this danger, freeing the front part of her choke. As she is doing that, she's delivering a knee or a kick to the groin area of John because it's open. It's a target area that's available. She follows up with further strikes, palm strikes to the face further knee strikes, and a possible elbow strike to the back of the head or the neck. At this point in time, she's free to leave the scene because she's safe to do so. In this view, we can see the choke applied to the front of Marnie's throat. The thumbs are applying pressure to Marnie's throat. She must act quickly with this plucking response. She's plucking at the hands of the attacker. <coughs> this view presents the legs of the attacker and please note that there are spread and this is because the attacker must be balanced and strong when they apply the choke to the victim. This allows for Marnie to make the plucking movement for the defense against the choke and deliver a simultaneous attack to the groin area of the attacker. If the attacker is at a distance, the foot or shin area will be striking the groin. If the attacker has his bent arms during the choke or is smaller, that will necessitate delivering a knee to the groin area as the counterattack. <coughs> when the attacker is close, the knee will be delivered as the counterattack. <coughs> Here, Marnie's making the plucking defense and delivering the knee counterattack to the groin. This drops John's body, and Marnie attacks with palm strikes to the chin and her fingers towards John's eyes. <coughs> Again, Marnie's defending the choke, plucking, delivering a knee, following up with counterattacks, and again, another knee is possible here. Because a knee is delivered to the groin, John has dropped as far as his height and his weight is concerned. This presents a valuable target to Marnie towards the back of John's head or his neck. She's hitting with elbow strikes to the back of the head or neck, if John is close, if John happened to drop at a further distance, downward hammer fist punches would be appropriate. And at this point, Marnie is free to leave the scene. Now we're going to present this exercise to you in real speed, in real time. <coughs> the defense is presented in stages so that you can learn the technique as it's broken down. The pluck is stage one and can be repeated over and over again until you learn it. Once you feel comfortable with that, the first counterattack can be delivered simultaneous to the defense. As you see, Marnie is plucking and delivering a sharp knee to the groin area because that's the area we know will be vulnerable in the attacker. <laughs> The next scenario deals also with the choke in the place. However, the angle has changed. In this particular exercise, we're going to deal with an attacker that applies a choke in the place, but the attack comes from behind. From this position, the attack is applied from behind. So therefore, the fingers around the throat are presenting a 
crushing type power to the front of the trachea. The defense must be made quickly and instinctively. From this scene, you can see the attacker approaching from the rear, applying the choke. The fingers are firmly surrounding the front part of Michael's throat, and the attack is made. Michael is making an instinctive plucking type reaction to the immediate threat, making a diagonally step out and back. The hand that made the pluck on the inside of the attacker's hand is now flying to the groin. Michael's bringing his hand up, applying elbow strikes to the face and throat area. And when it's safe to do so, he's rotating in with attacks, hammer fist punch, left punch, grabbing the attacker and delivering further counterattacks with knees, straight punches or hammer fists, uppercuts, and when it's safe to do so, he leaves the scene. <coughs> For instructional purposes, we'll break down the exercise. Michael is standing facing the camera. In this case, the attack comes and he's being choked. He'll immediately respond with an instinctive type defense, the plucking defense, to free the choke around his throat. As he is doing that, and as you see him repeat the exercise, he will be stepping out and diagonally back. Of course, this exercise could be performed going to Michael's right. In this case, he simply is demonstrating it going to his left. That's stage one. Again, re with the repetition of stage one, Michael is plucking, he stepped diagonally back. Michael's right arm will continue now for stage two, which is a strike to the attacker's groin area. You see that he's using the fingers curling up to go underneath the groin area to cause maximum impact and pain. From this position, the attacker should bend slightly forward as a result of being struck in the groin. Michael is in a position to give an upward elbow strike to the throat or chin area. At this point in time, he can deliver multiple elbow strikes on a horizontal plane. At this position, he'll be ready to turn and continue attacks with a hammer fist and a follow-up punch with the left hand. He will grab the attacker and follow up with appropriate knee strikes and possible hammer fist punch or other punch until it is safe for him to leave the scene. In this scene, the exercise is reviewed from the back of Michael. You'll see the attack is being applied. Michael is making a plucking instinctive type of defense while stepping diagonally back into the outside. The inside hand continues to the groin, the fingertips up and underneath the groin. Michael pulls his hand back and delivers elbow strikes to the throat or chin. Michael will then be able to turn and face his attacker, delivering hammer fist punch and other follow-up punches, grabbing the attacker, delivering knee strikes and further counterattacks as necessary. In this next scenario, we are also dealing with a choke that's delivered from the front. The attacker is applying a very strong choke to the front of the throat. But unlike the other exercise that we've presented, this exercise relies less on in instinct, but provides for a stronger defense. In this position, I'm attacking Marnie again from the front. My hands are firmly around her throat, and my thumbs are pressing on the trachea. Marnie's going to make a rotational defense, causing a lock on my wrist. She's going to clear the hands and follow up with counterattacks. In this view, we can see the attack applied to Marnie. The hands are around her throat. Marnie quickly steps back and is making a rotational move to free the hands, dropping her elbow to clear the hands from her throat, attacking immediately with elbows to the throat or the chin, catching the attacker, and delivering knees or kicks to vulnerable areas such as the groin. She can follow up with additional hand attacks if needed, or elbows. Here she's free to leave the scene. 
In this view, you can see the choke firmly applied to Marnie's throat. The defensive action will include Marnie bursting backwards quickly, raising her arm and rotating her body. The inside of her arm stays close to her head and ear area. This allows the defense to clear the, the attack at the wrist or back of the hands. Once this is accomplished, Marnie will drop her elbow to clear the hands from her face area, following up with counterattacks such as a quick elbow to the chin or throat. When the head moves further back, Marnie will apply hammer fist punches to the neck, grabbing the attacker and delivering sharp knee strikes to the groin area. When it's safe to do so, she will flee the scene. To break the exercise down for learning purposes, you'll see the exercise in its various stages. The first stage is the choke is applied to Marnie's throat. Immediately, Marnie is going to step back and raise the opposite hand. She's stepping back on her left leg and raising her right hand. This will allow her to rotate. If you notice when she steps back, she's maintaining at least a shoulder distance spread between the legs. This allows her body to rotate and cross the plane of the attack. Also notice her arm. Her arm stays with the bicep close to the ear so it'll cross the attacker's hands at the back of his wrist or hands. This is stage one. Once she goes back into stage one, stage two is then applied. You notice Marnie's hand is raised. That hand will drop to clear the attacker's hands. If possible, Marnie will use her other hand to trap the attacker's hands on her chest. This will, so to speak, make handcuffs, which will not allow the attacker to remove his hands from Marnie's area. If he pulls on the hands, it'll bring Marnie in and Marnie will come into the attacker with many elbows, hammer fist strikes, and follow up with the last stage, grabbing the attacker and delivering sharp knees to the groin area. Stage one, arm raise in the rotation. Stage two, clear the hands and trap the hands. Stage three, elbow strikes. Stage four, hammer fist punches. The last stage, grab the attacker and deliver knee strikes. When it's free and it's safe, leave the scene. In this next scene, we see the rotational defense against a choke applied in a different context. Chokes do not always occur while you're standing in your place. The choker can be pushing you backwards, and if this occurs, your weight will be back, our arms up from having fallen backwards, and in a position unable to make a plucking type of defense. Our choice is to make the rotational defense. The rotational defense will clear the hands from the throat without a plucking motion. The hands are then cleared, counterattacks can follow, and then once it's safe to do so, the defender can leave the scene. In this next scenario, we're going to deal with a threat uh, that basically is a choke from the rear in the place. In this particular defense, however, we are not doing an instinctive reaction like a plucking defense. The defender accomplishes the defense by making a ro quick rotation of the body, freeing the hands that are around his neck, and continuing with various attacks. The reason for this variation is that there may be a tactical reason why the defender wants to change his relationship in position to the attacker. And second of all, this type of turning or rotational defense does give the defender more power. The attack will be applied, 
And as usual, I will be applying the pressure to the front of Michael's throat. In this case, because the choke comes from the rear, my fingers will be applying pressure to the front of Michael's throat. In examining this exercise, you'll note that once the attack is made, Michael will be stepping forward. And as he steps forward, his hand comes up, staying close to his ear. Michael makes a quick rotation, clearing the hands, and attacking immediately with a hammer fist to the attacker. He comes back and counterattacks with an overhand right punch, and now is in a position to grab the attacker and offer various knee strikes and any further hand strikes as needed. As the choke is applied to Michael, his first reaction will be to raise his arm and step. Note how close his arm is to his face. As he turns, the attacker's hands will be moved from his throat and neck area. Michael then can follow up with an immediate hammer fist down on the attacker and an overhand right, changing his position slightly, his weight in the counterattacks. From this point, he can grab the attacker and deliver sharp knee strikes to vulnerable parts on the attacker's body. Here, Rex, the attacker, applies the choke to Michael's throat. Michael is making the defense by stepping forward and raising his hand immediately, keeping the hand very close to his ear. As he rotates, he will cut across the hands of the attacker, freeing his throat. Coming down with an immediate hammer fist to the face, head, or neck of the attacker, following with an overhand right as he steps in, following up with knee strikes as he's grabbing and pulling the attacker forward, and another overhand right. He can retreat from the scene at this point. In order to learn the exercise, Michael's going to break down the technique in its logical steps. First of all, we assume that the attack has been placed around Michael's throat. He's going to step forward to create some distance, rotating very harshly, keeping his hand very close to his head area. The inside of his bicep is almost pressed against his ear. This position will allow him to free the hands that are around his throat by crossing at the attacker's wrists or the back of the attacker's hands. Michael's already in a position with his raised hand to deliver, to deliver a downward hammer fist blow, stepping and giving an overhand right punch, stepping in further to deliver a series of sharp knee blows to vulnerable targets on the attacker's body. If further counterattacks are needed, he's in a position to do so. And when it's necessary or when it's appropriate, Michael can retreat from the scene. Here we present a variation on the rotational defense for a choke that occurs from behind. Here the attacker is pushing the defender forward. The same defense is applied and the same counterattacks follow. In our system of self-defense, we want to be complete in that we want to be able to deal with threats from any possible angle. For instance, in choke, we have defenses that deal with the choke, whether the choke occurs from the rear, from in front, or from the side, or any angle in between. We also deal with situations where the attacker may be pulling the defender, where the attacker may be delivering the choke in the place, or the attacker may be driving through the defender with some type of push or shove. We also know from experience that chokes can occur on the ground. For instance, if someone is attacked while they're lying on a bed, they're in a prone position. And many standing fights end up on the ground. I'm going to attack Marnie and take her to the ground, 
and she's going to be making a defense against a choke that's delivered from a side position to her body. Here, Willie, as the attacker, has Marnie on her back and has his hands firmly around her throat. Marnie's first defensive position or movement will be to pluck with her outside hand against Willie's right hand, freeing that part of her throat. She will at the exact same time deliver a strike to the throat area, which is sensitive, causing Willie to back up. At that point, her inside leg in a folded position comes up and the knee is placed in the center of Willie's chest, pushing him back, which creates enough room for Marnie's outside leg to deliver counterattacks, kicks, pushing him away. Marnie can get up and uh, apply further kicks and then leave the scene when it's safe. For learning purposes, we'll break down the exercise into its logical stages. The attack is made, Willie's weight is on the throat of the defender. The defender, Marnie, will simultaneously pluck with her outside hand, freeing part of the throat, and with her inside hand, deliver a strike to the throat of Willie just above the collarbone. This area is a sensitive area. There's almost like a hole there that receives the strike Marnie is giving. The natural reaction is for Willie to retreat. This calls for stage two. In stage two, the knee comes shooting up and creates a distance for Marnie, pushing Willie back and not allowing Willie to collapse on her. This pushing back immediately allows the leg to come up for stage three, which is a solid kick to the face. As many times as is necessary, with the last kick, pushing him away, Marnie rises quickly and is able to kick further if necessary or retreat. We are presenting now a new set of problems and solutions. It is the defenses against headlocks. The headlock can be either a choke or, that, or just a strong pressure to the neck. The first one that we will deal with is headlock from the side. The opponent is, the attacker is approaching you from behind or from the side. He is grabbing your neck area this way. Here. He can cause some kind of damage and pressure, especially if he's very strong to your neck. He can also punch your face, and he can even take you to the ground. Here, maybe continue. When you are already in a, this type of hold, when the attacker already grabbed you, then what is left is, of course, to make the release effectively. as early as possible, strike with the open hand to its groin. With the other hand, simultaneously, you reach between your heads and grab a sensitive and vulnerable point. You then push this point diagonally upwards and then sharply down, placing the attacker in a vulnerable position. As needed, counterattack more with a punch when the opponent is going down strike him again and then as needed counterattack again and remove yourself from the danger zone as the attacker is grabbing Marnie buries her face into the attacker's ribs thus she is presenting a non-verbal target to the punch if he manages to deliver one as the attacker is grabbing you and you're being sent down and forward, you must strike early to the groin. Because of his movement, his momentum, you may have to make a step forward. This is a byproduct to the technique. Inserting the hand between the heads, then grabbing a sensitive point. It can be 
under the nose, the first point, without inserting your fingers to his mouth. The second point can be the eyes. The purpose of this point pressure is to bring his chin up and then send him down. The last option is to grab the front of the hair, strongly pull backwards and then down. As you press the opponent backwards and down, he is in a vulnerable position, then you attack as needed, either with a hammer punch or with a straight punch sending him down. <coughs> and now for our learning stages. You start with a strike to the groin of the opponent and simultaneously bring the other hand high up between the heads. This may be accompanied by a step. Our second stage is to pull at the sensitive point. And then we finish with counter-attacking. We are presenting now another type of headlock, much more dangerous one, as the attacker approaches you from the rear and applying very strong pressure against your windpipe with the sharp side of the forearm. When he's doing this, he's preventing you from breathing and definitely can cause strong and big damage to your windpipe. David will present a quick and fast release and counter-attacking against this type of grab. As the attacker approaches and grabs you from behind in the armbar type of attack, simultaneously you send both hands and turn with your head, grabbing his hands, pulling them to your chest. You are twisting strongly now you take your head out from the grab, step out, and counter-attack first the groin, and then other attacks as needed. As the attacker approaches from the rear and grabs your neck, send your hand backwards and simultaneously turn as early as possible with the hook-like position of the palms, grab his hands and pull them. You must turn your chin very quickly sideways touching your shoulder. David now pulls the attacker's hands down to his chest but this is creating an opening. From this opening he can come out with his head escaping the grab. When the head is out and the hips are turned, you must step out and forward towards the attacker. This brings you to a position that you can counter-attack immediately to the groin area. Then you continue with other counter-attacks as needed and move from the danger zone. The learning stages are as follows. First, we must prepare ourselves to be able to make the plucking technique very strongly. So we send and pluck only with the right hand, learning the process of with the hook hand plucking and pulling the opponent's hand. Then we do it with two hands. We send two hands simultaneously, grabbing the opponent's hands, hitting the 
opponent's face may be a byproduct here. Now comes the whole first stage. That is turning the body and the chin strongly. Your chin must touch your shoulder when you're making this technique. This is phase number one. After finishing the first step, first stage, take your head out from the grab. This is easy to be made as your chin is turned and the head will slide easily out from the grab. You step towards the attacker and then start counter-attacking, start with a knee and finish up with other counter-attacks as needed. It may happen that against a very strong attacker you will not be able to take your head out. But where are we now? We are in a position like headlock from the side. So what is left is to make a release like we've learned before. <laughs> the attacker is applying a headlock now. But this time, he's applying another type of headlock from the rear. The attacker is sending his elbow more forward. By this, the crook of the elbow is in front of your windpipe. When the opponent is now choking, and it can be done this way with the hands, with the left is over the right, or the opposite, where the right is over the left. When the attacker is choking you now, what happens? He's blocking the f blood flow in the carotid artery, and you may faint in a very, very short time. You must react decisively and immediately. As the attacker attacks, send your hands backwards, and only one hand one palm can grab with the hook like the area of his hands. The other hand must join as early as possible pulling at the forearm. You cannot turn early. You can turn only after you start pulling and removing the forearm from your neck. The elbow, while you're pulling, is being directed sideways. Pull while the elbow is sideways. Now we continue exactly as before in the previous exercise. We get out, counter-attack, and move away. another type of headlock. It is really with the same type of pressure being applied on the tachia and to the neck. But this time the defender is bent and the attacker is over him, above him. Please David. In this position my forearm is pressing, pressing very strongly at his tachia. When I'm arching back the pressure is being increased and to his neck uh, applied also. David has to respond very quickly with relieving of the pressure 
and counterattacks and get out from this problem. <coughs> Wade joined us as the attacker. He will grab David's neck. David is bending. Wade is applying very strong pressure on the windpipe of uh, David. David has to respond quickly while Wade is arching back. And even before he's arching back, he must send his hand and trap and hook, pluck the attacker's hand, and at the same time, counterattacking to the groin. Continue with counterattacks to the groin and elbows to the head, and then join two hands to grab the attacker's palms. The defender then is going in, arching and turning, releasing himself, getting out from the grab, and as needed, continue with counterattacks. When he feels safe, he can move away from the attacker. In slow mo, we see David, the defender, inserting his palm, hook-like, to pull the defender's hands, to reduce the pressure. He's assisting with his shoulder, continue to press the hands of the uh, attacker. Simultaneously with the pluck, the defender is counter-attacking immediately with an open hand to the groin area. Continue with the counterattack. The most appropriate one is now an elbow directed to the opponent's head. Then repeat the counterattacks to the groin and to the head. After the initial counterattacks, you must get out from the remaining grab. One of the options is to join with two hands on the attacker's hands. Go diagonally forward with the right leg arch under the armpit and arm of the opponent, turn, get out from the grab, and follow up with more counterattacks as needed. When you feel safe, get out from the danger zone. We will show now another option of getting out from the grab. Turn your head sideways. At the same time, bring your hand to the hollow between the collarbones of your opponent. Push the thumb against his neck, remove your head from the grab, and distance yourself from the attacker and counterattack again with another kick. Move from the danger zone as early as possible. For learning purposes, we will show now the stages of the technique. First, Pluck the opponent's hand while inserting your shoulder to create pressure on his hands, thus remove the, his forearm from your neck. Simultaneously, you attack to the groin. You continue then with counterattacks to the head with elbow and to the groin with the palm. When you feel no much of resistance, you can get out while grabbing his hand by two hands, stepping diagonally forward, arching under his armpit, then turning towards him and finishing with more counterattacks and fleeing the scene when you feel comfortable doing this. We are presenting you now with a new set of problems and solutions. This time, the problem is a bear hug. With the bear hug, the opponent can inflict some kind of damage to you. 
He can also move you around. He can limit your movement, trap your hands, uh, limit your body movement, so another person can come and hit you. I will show first a bear hug when Caroline will be with the hands free. My hands will be tight behind her back. As early as possible, Caroline will bring her hands to the attacker's face and push her thumbs to his eyes. Then she continues with counterattacks with a hammer punch. Caroline finishes with an elbow strike to the head and a knee kick to the face. And now for our learning stages. The first stage is creating distance, leaning backwards and bringing the palms to the side of the face of the opponent. This is done and then the next stage will be to push strongly with the thumbs against his eyes. After fulfilling this stage, the defender should counterattack with starting with hammer punches and then finishing as needed, for example, elbow strikes and knee kicks. This time, as the attacker, I will grab Caroline with a bear hug, functioning the same as before for me, but for her, her arms will be pinned to her body. She will not be able to move them as before towards my eyes. As Caroline finds herself in a bear hug, her hands are pinned to her body. She pushes her buttocks backwards sliding her palms parallel to her body and then pushes like an arrow forward and then curling the fingers hitting the opponent's groin. From here she moves to his shoulder blades grabbing him and giving him knee kicks to the groin. She then finishes with taking her elbow out from the grab and using it to strike. In order to slide between the bodies, Karin has to push her buttocks backwards and parallel go with the palms between the bodies and then strike like an arrow curling with the fingers at the end of the motions. As the first learning stage, Karin will push her hips backwards while sliding her palms parallel to the body coming forward in an arrow shape and then hitting the opponent's groin from under with curled fingers. After finishing the first stage, she will grab the opponent's shoulder blades, hit him with the knee as she now has a good distance for a knee strike. The last stage will be taking the hand out from the remaining of the grab, striking with an elbow to the back of the head.
Next, we will be confronting a new set of problems. These are the hair pulls. The opponent grabs your hair and then he's pulling you. He's pulling you towards him or maybe he's pulling you directly down in order to give you a knee kick or maybe a punch. He's inserting, come on please, he's inserting his fingers through your hair and then he's pulling you. As you're being pulled forward and down, you must initiate a strong step, bursting forward. As you do this, you block the opponent's attack, whether is it a knee kick or a hand strike. Simultaneously, you strike to the groin. After that, as a second step, you strike to the opponent's head, face, with the heel of the hand, and finish with a kick. Again, the attacker grabs your hair and pulls you. But this time, he's smarter, he's approaching you from behind. He's inserting his fingers through your hair, pulls you back. What you have to do is to deal with him and the other problems that he's presenting. That you have to turn as early as possible. The attacker approaches you from behind, grabs and pulls your hair. He's pulling your head down a little bit. You have to turn early, get in, block his attack, whatever it is, and simultaneously counterattack to the groin. After that, continue with other counterattacks, such as a heel hand to the face and another kick to the groin. Move from the danger zone as early as possible. And for our learning stages, start by leaning backwards and then turning, blocking as early as possible with the forearm and counter-attacking. Feel as if you are being pulled and turn and send the hand to block whatever attack is being sent towards you. After you finish your first stage of moving in and counter-attacking, Continue with other appropriate counterattacks. We hope you've learned from the tape the self-defense techniques. We're certain that this type of self-defense techniques present real issues, real problems, and solutions to these problems. Our feedback from people who have used this in the field, law enforcement personnel, have indicated that we are reaching success with these self-defense techniques. We want you to remember a couple of things. One, if you can avoid danger, do so before the problem presents itself. You should be aware of your surroundings. You must be able to conduct yourself in your environment so that you avoid the attack before it occurs. And if you can talk your way out of a problem, do it. But if someone leaves us no choice, we must perform technically in a correct manner. We must be aggressive. Nobody has the right to harm you or a loved one or a friend. You must be able to perform these self-defense techniques so that you can lead a safer, more confident life.
Krav Maga training seminars, instructor programs, apparel, Krav Maga services and merchandise. Visit our website at www.kravmaga.com.